Hello and welcome to another Real People Big Astronomy program. My name is Renee Kerrigan. I am a member of the Big Astronomy leadership team. Big Astronomy is a National Science Foundation funded program which has created a planetarium show that's being distributed for free or at very low cost around the world uh, to help people understand that that the big observatories that are being built around the world uh, to observe space to operate uh, big science and astronomy take many diverse people with teams from all around the world with all sorts of different skills uh, to make them happen and that's true of, of astronomy and all kinds of big science um, so that show is available on our website which is bigastronomy.org uh, and the program has a lot of different uh, facets. So we also have educational activities that were created for this topic by the Astronomical Society of the Pacific. And we have an educator guide for teachers. Um, we have more resources on our website, bigastronomy.org. And finally, there's educational research being done on this program by the University of, um, by Michigan State University. And one of the components of this program is this live event series, which um, in which we are honored to talk to some of the staff who work at these observatories um, who help make this big science happen all the time. So this uh, Real People Big Astronomy series is an ongoing series. And today we are very pleased to be speaking with Dr. John Carpenter, who is the observatory science observatory scientist at ALMA. So he is going to be telling us about his job and a little bit about his life outside of astronomy today. So John, thank you so much for being here with us today. Hi Renee, and th and th uh, my pleasure and thanks for inviting me. Uh, if you are, are joining us here on Zoom, please know that there is uh, Spanish interpretation available, so you can choose that at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. Make sure you have selected panelists and attendees to do so. And if you're watching us on Facebook, take a moment to share this uh, video so that we can reach more people. Also, you can leave us com uh, questions in your in the chat. Um, excuse me, leave us questions in the comments section, and we'll be happy to answer them as we go or um, at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and start sharing my screen so that we can uh, have some visuals to go with our presentation today. And we'll go ahead and, and get started. So the first thing uh, we like to ask is a, is a pretty basic question, but just can you can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about what you do uh, in your career, John? Yeah. So the um, yeah. So I'm the Alma Observatory scientist, and so Alma is a uh, is a um, it's a telescope. It's called the Interferometer. That's located in the northern part of the uh, northern part of Chile. And um, it's a wonderful facility. It's one of the, it's the, basically the biggest, um, most powerful submillimeter telescope um, that's ever um, been built. And, um, and, and, and so my role within ALMA is to basically provide scientific advice to, um, uh, to the project, how best, how to optimize um, ALMA. So, um, you know, there's many things we always, we always want to improve ALMA, we always want to make it better. And, um, and so we need both advice from engineers, we need from, uh, from software people, we need from scientists. And so I provide, you know, um, you know, basically try to find the scientific advice so we, we optimize um, ALMA in, in, in the best way. Um, I'm also an astronomer. I do research on my own. Um, and, um, um, and I do research primarily on what we call protoplanetary disks. Um, so these are rotating, um, um, disks of gas and dust around very young stars, which form planets, and um, almost been making some wonderful discoveries around those. And so um, that's been the, the focus of my research. It sounds very interesting. So, and in, uh, if I can, you know, sort of rephrase or, or what you told me, um, your job is to know ALMA so well that you can help other scientists use it to the best of its ability. Um, and to get the best research that they can out of it. And then also to do your own research. Yeah, yeah that's basically right, yeah. Like having a, a, a sort of like um, 
Well, you just have a super tool <laughs> that you work with and, and you help other people use it uh, in the, the best ways it can. So it, sound, it sounds uh, very interesting and probably rewarding since you, you get to help other people and also um, do your own observations with this fantastic astronomy tool. Yeah, it's something that I've, I've always been, um, um, it's always been appealed to me, right? Because you are enabling other people, you know, to use this telescope in, in the best possible way. And you're trying to listen to them and saying, you know, in the future, what are their needs are and how to make it better. And, um, and it's always, yeah, it's always satisfying when you're able to help them and, uh, and have them get, um, to get the best, get the most out of their own research. Mm -hmm. So we like to ask folks who are on this series about their path um, because it's not always what you might expect. So how did you end up uh, in the career that you are in today? Yeah, so, um, well, I've always been interested in, in uh, science and math um, as a kid. And so I was going to be a scientist of some sort. I was pretty sure of that. Um, but um, um, and eventually I, I chose astronomy. Um, so I, I grew up in Wisconsin um, and I went to uh, um, the University of Wisconsin Madison for um, for my undergraduate uh, degree, and I majored majored in astronomy. Um, just it was just something that I was just just interested in, um, um, you know, them as a kid. And then um, I went to uh, got my PhD in astronomy um, at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, and they had a radio telescope there, um, not a interferometer or many telescopes like Alma, but just um, just a single telescope. And um, so I used that um, quite a bit. Um, when I graduated, then I went to the um, um, University of Hawaii and I was there for three years doing a postdoctoral um, fellowship. And they have many telescopes on the Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And I was very fortunate to be able to use many of those. Um, then after that, I went to uh, the California Institute of Technology um, and I was um, uh, involved, um, helped run and an observatory there called at the time Owens Valley Millimeter um, Array, and which also eventually came what we call CARMA, the Combined Array for Research in Nova Astronomy. So I was actually at Caltech for 18 years. And so that was, I had a wonderful time there um, helping up, up, um, with operating the telescope there. And then about five and a half years ago, um, then I moved to Chile um, to start um, working on ALMA. And um, so Chile, um, the, the joint ALMA observatory where I work at is at uh, is in Santiago, and the observatory itself is in northern is in northern Chile. So it's been um, so it's been a zigzag across the, the country and and, and across the, the, the Americas, but it's it's been a great journey. I've learned from from you and from other folks that I've spoken to with this program that being an astronomer or working with astronomy, not necessarily being an astronomer um, only, but working with astronomy or science, it seems to be uh, you become a world traveler uh, or at least a, tra an, a, a national traveler uh, to work at all these different facilities, a nice bonus of the job if you enjoy traveling. Yes, yes, definitely. So what has been one of the uh, biggest challenges to your career? We, we like to ask this because we know everyone, no matter what their job is, they face challenges um, or in, in their schooling, wherever they happen to be. And it's important to know that you, that very successful people, they overcome those challenges to, to get to where they are today. So what would you say one of the largest challenges has been in your career and how you dealt with it? Yeah. For me personally, it's always been um, public speaking. Um, it's something that, um, um, I've always been, you know, just nervous about and, 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 and shy about and, um, and, um, we there, and some of my early, very early colloquium that I'd given to audiences, some of them were, were looking back were really pretty bad, <laughs> um, uh, but you learn and, um, and you gain more confidence and, um, and, um, you know, and other people, you know, they show the confidence in you. And so I, I, I you know, I definitely felt I've, I've improved over it, but that's probably been uh, the thing that's always given me the most um, appreh apprehension. It's just that the public speaking aspect, but it's also very important um, for, for, um, for this job as well. Um, so, but so thankfully I've been able to work at it and get better at it as I've, as I've gone along. You can overcome any sort of, um any sort of 
fear or or uh, apprehension about that is something I've learned because I, I actually share that with you, John. I When I first started doing what I do, I was absolutely terrified of public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> and now it's pretty much what I do. <laughs> but yeah. uh, there is a time. So I, I, I sympathize with that. Um, what would you say a favorite thing about your job is and, and why do you enjoy that aspect so much? Yeah. Oops. You, yeah. Oh, I you, skipped ahead. Oops. Let me yeah. get back. There we go. Yeah, well, you, you actually already alluded to it, um, um, and that is uh, Alma's international um, 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 observatory, an international organization. And so one of the, um, um, the perks of my job is that I do get to travel um, around the world, interesting places, meet other people with Alma, to meet, go to conferences and meet with people who are using Alma. And um, so you get to go to a lot of interesting places and meet, meet um, Meet um, meet a lot of people. People you, you know normally often you only meet over emails and you get to actually meet them in face, and um, and it's just wonderful to see all the the different places um, in the world and, and meet with the people who are working on Alma, meet with the people who are using Alma, and um, just and talk with them and so on. So yeah, so I've been up well up until about a year and a half ago. <laughs> it's been it's been great to just been able to travel and and and, and um, so that, I think that's one of the uh, one of the great perks of this job. And it's and travel probably will be opening back up again before too long. Yeah. Fingers yeah, crossed. Absolutely. Knock on wood. <laughs> whatever whatever lucky thing you might do. Uh, you have some beautiful pictures here of some of the different places you've been. Uh, it looks like. Yeah, so the um, some of these are, um, um, see, one is that painting from um, it was a museum in Vienna, which was very nice. Um, another is a castle in, um, it's in Ringberg, Germany. There was a conference there. Um, and I think the other two, uh, they actually may be from Vienna as well. Um, but there's many other places, you know, because um, Alma, so I've been to Japan quite a bit because um, we have a, a and Korea, Taiwan, and um, South Korea and Taiwan, and many other places. So, um, so yeah, there's many, 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 um, um, many places to go, which is great. Okay, so then we always ask the flip side of the coin: What would be your least favorite aspect of your job, and why <laughs> is that? Yeah, this is um, this was probably more of a necessary evil, but and anything else. But you know, sometimes the the meetings can get. Um, Quite extensive, um, but they're necessary. And um, but there's just some days where it can just be one after another, and it and it gets tired, and it gets and it, and it wears you down a little bit. But um, um, but often, yeah. So that that be, uh, but it's hard to get around it because you need to, uh, um, especially with this type of organization with so many people involved, you have to have that constant communication with people to make sure everybody is on the same page and and. and um, and everybody's going along the same path, but uh, but yeah, it can be tiring at times. And you were certainly not the first person who has told me that in this, in this <laughs> series. I think I've heard that at least maybe half the time. That is what people yeah, right? have told me, okay. this. or maybe email is <laughs> another one I hear. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and now in the era of Zoom meetings, and we some Zoom meetings uh, or whatever uh, virtual meetings, they can be even more exhausting than the in-person ones, I think. That's right, I, I think so, yeah. So what would be your, your favorite astronomical object? Yeah, I, I, was, I was thinking about this. I basically had two in mind, and I, I decided to go with um, um, HL Tau. Um, and so this is an image, an Alma image that was taken about a little over five years ago. And it's showing the, um, the dust emission. So um, around in a protoplanetary disk around a star, um, HL Tau. So it's a very young star, only um, only about a million years old. Um, and um, and the reason why I showed this was sort of like a uh, one of the biggest moments uh, astronomical discoveries from from Alma, and it really changed um, the thinking in this field quite a bit. And so um, and the reason what's what's so sp spectacular about this image, you see these series of concentric dark rings. Um, and it is thought, um, many people think that each of those rings is associated with a planet that's orbiting around the star, car carving out a gap within the disk. Now, 
we actually don't know if that's the right interpretation or not. There's a lot of debate on going, which is one of the reasons why it's one of my favorite objects is it generated so much discovery. But the reason why it's, um, it's, it's, it's so, um, I guess, special to me is that, you know, people have been observing these objects for, for, for many years. And at, at my previous observatories, we spent a lot of time um, looking at these objects, looking for structure within these objects, trying to understand how planets form. But this was just mind blowing. And so, so much, such a huge leap forward from what we saw previously that it, it just, um, it's just um, special to look at every time, you know, I, know I see the image and, and um, it's really had this had a, a, one, a tremendous impact um, within the field. And so, um, and it's just spawned a whole host of other studies of people trying to understand what it's causing these dark rings. So I think it's, it's, it's a very special object for people who work in this field. And one that you know was observed with with Alma in this this fantastic high resolution, correct? I mean, without the Alma Observatory, we would not be able to see this object uh, in this way. Um, is that that's correct? Right. Yeah, that, that's right. And and it's it was interesting is that this object was selected to be observed because. It was bright, but people expect it to be pretty boring and that there wasn't much to see. And it just blew everybody away. Yeah. It was just it was just amazing. Well, and I know that there is a debate ongoing that we don't know exactly what's creating the, those rings, but it is wonderful to think that we could be watching a, a very young solar system, you know, forming there. Um, it just, yeah, I, I understand why that would be a favorite object for you. Um, astronomy has a way of, of giving us all that that sense of wonder. Yeah. So could you tell us, uh, you, you told us a little bit about what you do already, but um, what does a, a day at work look like for you um, as an observatory scientist? What, what would a typical day at, at work be like? Yeah, it can be, it can actually vary quite a bit. Um, and um, so ignoring the, the pandemic aside, which um, changed things, but um, there's um, it's, a lot of it is um, reading what other people have produced, because people have ideas, for example, on how they want to um, in, um, improve AMA. And so you need to read what, um, what they've written and think about it and saying like, you know, and offer suggestions and, you know, how, you know, how this could be approved, or maybe it's a great idea, or maybe, you know, so just offering such um, constructive um, suggestions and how we can and, and, um, um, improve it further. So more of a collaborative interactions of how, we, how, um, how to do things. Um, there's writing similar reports myself, you know, if I have an idea of how we should structure something or how we should do something, I will have to write those reports and, um, and make it clear for other people. And so other people then can read them and comment on them and, and trying to find the best way. Um, there's a lot of talks um, that I would have to give. Um, so I gave one yesterday for to the Alma staff, for example, where you're just describing um, either what I'm doing right now or describing ideas of what we want to do in the future. And um, so just so people understand where the observatory is going, everybody understand what the big picture is like. Um, I go to the observatory itself um, probably once every couple months for a week at a time. And, um, and you know, usually just, you know, more of an observing mode, just, you know, make sure that, you know, more of a manager type, manager type role to see if anything's happening with the observatory that needs my attention and just, you know, make sure that everything is going okay. Um, there'll be a lot of traveling to meetings, um, usually worldwide. Um, right now they're all Zoom, but, um, the, um, but a lot of meetings, um, visiting other people, conveying what we're trying to do at the Joint Alma Observatory um, versus and understanding what other people are doing at, at the other places, the other, the other uh, we have what we call these Alma regional centers throughout, uh, throughout the world. And so we want to understand better what they're doing. And so, um, so just trying to keep the communication back and forth. And, um, and a lot of work on the computer for all of this. Um, and also doing my own um, um, science um, programs, um, you know, reducing data or reading papers from other people. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a many, it's a many variety of things actually. Um, and so, but it's a lot of, lot of it, I guess that there's underlying theme, a lot of it is just the communication. Um, between what we want to do versus what other people want to do and make sure that we're trying to do the best thing. 
We had a, a good question while you were describing um, your your day at work, and I think related to when we were speaking about H. A. Tao. But uh, we've been talking about the Alma Observatory, and maybe we haven't given a good descriptor of what makes Alma special. So could you uh, very give us a very basic um, a, a very basic description of what the Alma Observatory is? Sure. So Alma, um, so Alma, is the, the telescope itself is shown here in the, in the picture that's in the, in the bottom, um, in the left corner. And um, so this is an array. It actually contains 66 telescopes at, at all. And so normally when you think of a telescope, you think of just, just one telescope pointing at the sky and doing its own thing. But Alma is its instrument we call the interferometer. And so we have all these telescopes, but they, they operate in concert. And, um, and so they all look at, they look at the, the um, an astronomical object all at the same time. But because the way the interferometer works, it allows us to look, look at very small details um, on the sky and uh, invert what we call angular resolution. And so it allows us to see very small features within astronomical objects, much finer than you can see in any single, um, um, any single, um, any single telescope itself. Now, there are other telescopes like this that have been built um, in the world, and they're even operational today. And I've worked on one previously before I came to Alma. But there's a number of things that make Alma just the, basically the, uh, by far the best telescope of its, of its kind in the world. One is it has 66 of, of these antennas, um, and usually 50 of them operating any one time looking all at the same object of the sky. And so it's just the more antennas you can put looking at an, um, or telescopes you can put looking at an object, the finer details one can see, um, the more sensitive one can see and see fainter objects in the sky. This looks, this makes it much more powerful. Um, it's also at a very high elevation. It's at um, 5,000 meters above, uh, um, above, above sea level. And, um, and that makes it, um, also makes it makes it very sensitive to, to telescopes because there's um, um, there's atmosphere itself limits how well astronomical observations can go. So the higher you go up, then the, we can limit the amount of um, limit the atmosphere um, um, contributions to that limit us, us, and that allows us to make much more sensitive images. Um, you can also move these telescopes around. Right here, all the telescopes are relatively close to each other. But the, um, we can actually move these telescopes around on the plateau um, that's, that's on this mountain. And that allows us to also look at, um, look at the objects, at, um, look at very fine detail in these objects. So all of these things, it's all, it's all these things combined, the high elevation, the large number of telescopes, um, the you know, be able to ex extend the telescopes very far apart. Everything is just state of the art compared to all the other telescopes that, of this time that had been built before, and that's why it's been such a um, it's been making such wonderful discoveries because it's just the um, it's just been um, built to optimize everything as best as possible. So it was a very complicated project to build at that super high elevation, and then of course the fact that you can move these uh, t individual telescopes around to different orientations. You have to have a, a great big machine to to move them around, um, and then you know so such a big project is it's why it it benefited from having the the multinational project, right? So uh, Japan, the European. Uh, Southern Observatory and uh, the National Science Foundation all working together to make ALMA uh, the reality of the fantastic observatory that it is today. Exactly, that the telescope was just far too big for any one country to um, to build, and so it really required um, the um, all these different regions coming together with the common with the common goal and contributing to to build this. Mm -hmm and operate it, and they, all, and they all contribute to the operations today. And if our viewers are curious about ALMA and would like to learn more, we actually did a, a program uh, called Meet ALMA that's just a, a big overview of this observatory. Um, and you can find that in a recorded video on our Facebook page as well as on our YouTube channel. So uh, that would be another good way to, to learn more if this program with Dr. Carpenter has piqued your interest. Um, 
So we asked you, we, we, we took a little detour there, but we asked you about a typical day at work. And then we like to ask, what about a, a day for you at home? We are all whole people who have lives outside of our work. So what is, what is the day for you at home like? Oh, I made fear. Um, <laughs> I actually work quite a bit from home as well. So maybe, <laughs> um, but uh, the things that I like to do um, more of a typical day. Um, um, well, I, I go to the farmer's market um, um, quite often. That's a good thing about Santiago. There's, there's many different places nearby, which I, I, I can go to and pick up uh, um, fresh um, fruits and vegetables. Um, I like to walk a lot. Um, and so I try to walk wherever I can go as much as possible. It just helps me, well, besides the exercise, it, it helps me think. Um, so especially if I come up across something that's um, puzzling me and I need to ponder it, you know, going for a brisk walk um, every, every day really helps me um, focus a little bit. Um, I'm, I, I like sports. And so um, there's a, I have my series of teams, um, White Sox, Blackhawks, Bulls, and Bears that I follow. Um, so there's usually one of those is usually in action um, on, 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 the, on a given night, depending on the time of year. Um, read the newspapers a lot, trying to keep up what's going on um, in the world and, and especially the United States where I'm, where I'm from. And, um, and yeah, and um, still, working quite a bit from home um, on work, emails, and everything like that, so. Especially in this past year, uh, maybe it's been like this for you always, but the, the separation between work and home seems to have gotten closer and closer uh, with many of us uh, working from <laughs> home. So uh, you, I think you told me earlier, but um, what was your favorite subject when you were in school? It, I guess there wasn't necessarily one subject, but it was basically anything related to math and science. So I just, um, as long as I can remember, I was just, um, um, uh, you know, I always tried to, you know, work ahead and, or read ahead um, in those subjects. So, um, yeah, it was math or it's chemistry or biology or, or, or phys physics. Um, I just found it uh, um, from, from all, all, all of it to be interesting. And so, um, so yeah, so that was, um, it was um, without question my, um, and, uh, my favorite subject. And um, I wasn't sure which, like I said earlier, I wasn't sure which science I was necessarily going to go into, but it, I knew, you know, it's, it was something that was always in the back of my mind. So yeah, you know, flip side, <laughs> yeah, for me, it was, um, it was, uh, it was like poetry. It's like something that I never um, got into. Something that, uh, but uh, I was, yeah, always waiting for a biology class to come. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was probably my least favorite. You were looking for something a little more logic driven than the than yeah, poetry. that's that's too long. <laughs> All right, so we, we always like to end with um, what do you like to do for fun? And, and maybe some of this uh, you've alluded to in some of your other answers, but it's always nice to hear yeah. what uh, the folks who work at these science facilities like to do for fun. Yeah, so um, yeah, I like, I like sports a lot. And, um, you know, especially, you know, if I get a chance to play, that would be great. So I, I enjoy playing basketball. And um, um, well, at least in the United States, I was playing softball um, quite a bit. Um, and um, and then I I've sort of rediscovered chess um, in the in the since the pandemic um, I, I actually played it as a kid um, but then uh, but I really started playing again uh, um, in the past year and um, and like I said one of the perks is you know get to uh, get to travel um, quite a bit and so uh, so sometimes I can peg um, add, add on a vacation on top of um, um, some other trip and so um, so. Just some of the few photos that I've been taking over over, over time, and so um, so um, as you can see, a lot of them are more nature orientated than city orientated. So that's just uh, so it's nice to see um, um, get out in the nature and see things. Really, really beautiful. Uh, looks like you've had some fun experiences exploring more wild places. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we do have a question. So folks, if you who are viewing, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments or um, in the chat window in Zoom. Um, and this question from Justin is maybe not specifically related to the the studies that you do, but he asks, "What are your thoughts on nanotechnology for space travel?" Oh, um, 
That's a very interesting um, question. Um, you're right. I, 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 um, 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 I don't know much about it um, personally, but um, it's, I, I find it fascinating some of the ideas that I've heard about how you could send, you know, very, um, um, very small um, um, cameras or, 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 or um, to other potentially other stars if you're going to be able to accelerate them. And so, um, you know, I have I don't have any insights of how practical it is, but if they can do it, I think it would be actually pretty fascinating if you can be able to do a flyby of a nearby star and see what, what their planetary systems are like. Um, but um, yeah, how feasible it is and or, or, when it could be, or when it could be feasible, yeah, I don't have any insights, but it's, it's a pretty, I find it a fascinating idea. So I have a question for you, John. Um, where do you, how do you think ALMA might uh, continue to keep, I know it's a cutting edge telescope, but telescopes um, are always evolving. So what do you think the next step for the ALMA observatory might be? It's funny you ask that because that's the talk that I gave yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> so you're well prepared. <laughs> that's another hour talk. Yes. Um, but, um, no, we actually have a, um, um, when, when they created ALMA, they, um, they had the foresight to actually have a, what they call a development program. So it's, it's amount of money that's allocated each year um, just to improve ALMA whether it's hardware or software or infrastructure. So things that will keep ALMA at the forefront. And we've been building um, new detectors. Um, and so we'll have a couple more coming on in the next few years. But we've actually outlined some of the, uh, the goals over the next decade of where we want to go. And I think that um, the main one that we want to achieve is that right now, you know, when you observe, um, when ALMA observes on the sky, you know, we observe over a finite range of wavelengths um, at any one time. We would like to get broaden that so you can observe even more wavelengths at the one time. That, that would increase the sensitivity of the telescopes. It would allow us to look at different types of um, different types of molecules that are, that are in sources. And it just provides a wealth of um, more information than we get now. And so it's a very challenging upgrade project that, um, that we want to do and requires a lot of coordination. So that's, a, that's the, one of the main things that we're, that we're planning um, to do now. And, uh, but it is a um, um, large part is in the planning, page, um, planning stages, but, um, but that's, what, um, that's the main thing that we're thinking now. But it's a tremendous resource that we have that we can be able to um, have this steady source of funding to do these type of developments. It's very smart to have that uh, in the allocation for ALMA to keep yeah. it relevant. Um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that that is the case because it's a wonderful observatory and, and I'm, I'm glad it will be um, relevant in this way for long into the future. Well, uh, John, thank you so much for sharing your your insights with us about your job and, and about your life. It's been really fun to hear from you and, he, and get sort of a peek into your world. Um, I'd like to mention that this project, Big Astronomy, is, uh, is another National Science Foundation funded project. And as such, we have educational research that's being done associated with the project and how people learn. And uh, Gloria is here from the research team and is going to tell us a few words about how our viewers might be able to contribute to the research being done on the Big Astronomy Project. Hi everyone, like Renee said, this is an NSF funded project. As part of that, we are conducting education research around the Big Astronomy Project. So if you would like to help us out with that, we would really love if you could. You can help us out by filling out the survey that will be showing up in the comments. If you fill out the survey, you will receive a um, you'll, re you'll be entered to win a $10 Amazon gift card. Another way that you can help is you can opt in to talk with us um, two times over the next few months and afterwards receive a $40 gift card for Amazon. So if you would like to help us, we'd gladly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gloria. And thank you everyone for watching today. We hope that you've enjoyed learning with us today. 
Um, if you are enjoyed this program and would like to tune in to the next one, our next Real People Big Astronomy program will be next month, about a month from today on June 21st, and we'll be speaking with Adam Thornton, who works for the new um, Bear Rubin Observatory, also in Chile. So we'll learn a little bit more about his job and his life. But um, I'd like to just say one more big thank you to Dr. John Carpenter. Thank you so much for your time today. It was very uh, enjoyable uh, to learn from you. Thank you very much for today. It's, my, it's, my, it's been my pleasure. Thank you, everyone. I'll see you again next time um, and be looking for those links uh, to how you can fill out your surveys if you're